Hello and welcome to episode 83 for May 2019. This is episode 83 part 1, the astronomy themed show, so where better to record from than our own star party in the International Dark Sky Reserve of the Brecon Beacons, where we have hundreds of telescopes, tons of practical experience being shared, and lots of curious newbies taking their first tentative steps into the cool waters of collimation, polar alignment, star hopping and astrophotography. Ah, the great outdoors, never better than when you have the equipment to reveal entire galaxies and you're gently bathed in delicate photons from a million stars. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me again is someone for whom gentle bathing gave way long ago to caustic scrubbing as though attempting to scour away decades of sin, Paul. The blood, the blood, it won't wash off. <laughs> and the lady who keeps the show on the straight and narrow, injects some sense and sanity to proceedings, and knows the mass of Jupiter in kilograms to six decimal places. Jenny. Six. No, it's a 20. <laughs> Give me some credit, pal. <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> that like, news is a year old. Yeah. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that was when you were a mere amateur. <laughs> yeah, it was before I started the PhD. It was required to know at least 20. So we uh, we arrived off. We've arrived at different times during Astro Camp. Um, it's the first full day today. Um, we arrived yesterday, and just at the tail end of Hurricane Hannah, which was <laughs> was nice, as it was sweeping through with 50, 60 mile an hour winds, and the temperatures were down at zero. But there were some breaks in the clouds, which was nice last night. But now that it's actually started at Astro Camp, we're looking out the window, and we can actually see blue skies. It's it's quite nice out there now and it's, it's looking like it could be a good night of astronomy that's what I've heard it's going to be clear tonight until about one in the morning oh, excellent excellent so yeah yeah I brought a small telescope because the weather looked terrible <laughs> <laughs> dad's the same he was like oh well, we'll just take one I was like oh but what if the weather clears you'll regret it then and he was like oh alright maybe I'll put in two and I was like yeah but what about the solar scope and he was like oh I'll just put it all in and I'm glad we did now because mm. it's, nice it's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's gonna be hundreds of telescopes around, so it's gonna be great. We're yeah, look through a whole range. Clear of skies guarantee. Clear skies guarantee. TM. Clear skies guarantee. TM. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no one's died so far. Which is that was that incredible was, given was the temperatures and the wind. Night. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't here last night. I mm. was safely tucked up at home in bed, and my god, it woke me up at three a.m. and I was in a house. Mm. We were in the van. I didn't want to know what it's like being in a tent, but we were in the van and the van was shaking. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm amazed that no one took off. Yeah, John John was saying his tent was smacking him on the head when he was laying down. (laughs) (laughs) But that's the thing about astronomers, isn't it? I mean, people that are used to, in winter, standing in fields at at Mm. sub-zero temperatures, they're a hardy bunch. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've not done astronomy until there's frost on your arm. Yeah, no one one is put off by a hurricane. It's quite incredible. (laughs) Yeah, they go hurricane. Hmm, that puts smash your temper yeah. eggs down. <laughs> yeah, the, the drive here was really interesting. So it was that sort of like, oh, I'm I'm going to be driving in the middle lane now as the wind blows the car sideways. <laughs> <laughs> you see everybody, the whole motorway just drifting to the right. Like, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so now we sat in the cottage, just waiting for it to get dark later on tonight. Recording the podcast while we're waiting and have, enjoying a rather nice Finton's dry gin. And tonic, courtesy of our good friend Kevin Morgan, yeah. who's a listener to the show, and has uh, brought us some gin. I, over. I just want to say that he's a listener to the show. Mm-hmm. He brought us gin. Hmm? Just saying. Just, yeah, just that's, saying. That's what some do. Hashtag. Uh, cheers, cheers, guys. Oh, that's good. That's the way to do it. Strong, it's very nice gin. So, pint of science, Jen. Where are we with that? Yes, pint of science is this month, twentieth to the twenty second of May. Mm-hmm. It's happening all across the UK, right? It's not just in Cardiff. Yeah. Um, but the best one's going to be in Cardiff. Best one's going to be in reason. Cardiff, obviously, because I'm going to be mm. there. If you're interested, um, we are in Beelzebub's, which is one of the pubs um, just off St. Mary Street. Um, we've got three nights. Um, we've got two talks per night. Then we have an activity in the middle of each of the talks. We're going to have our infrared camera, which we've snaffled from the university. Um, so you can get to have a look at yourself in the infrared mm-hmm. or you know bring some objects see mm-hmm. what they look like in the infrared there is rumour that if you put that, that could get right. very very dodgy well, <laughs> yeah this is safe you know safe for the watershed objects <laughs> right okay <laughs> there will probably be children in the audience but that's really worth mentioning <laughs> 
there um there is rumor <laughs> that if you're heavily pregnant and you stand in front of an infrared camera you can see the baby like the outline of the baby because I the baby is warmer BS on that than like your outside skin. Oh, you but sure? you can test it though if you've got someone pregnant. Which is why we want someone heavily pregnant yeah. to come because I've heard Surely this. Surely we would know this. This would be like a thing. It should, should be a noble thing. This would be a known thing. Yeah. Surely. Mm. Well, write in. Tell us. This is a rumour that has gone around. Wow. Every time we take this camera mm. out to events, mm. this rumour goes around like, oh, I wonder if we'll find anyone pregnant. You're not going to have the resolution. You won't have the well, resolution. Well, no, you're not going to literally get, see fingers and toes. You might have a belly that's, 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 that's glowing. No, but the idea is that you'll see like the basic outline of the baby. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm not buying that. What if you find something wrong, though? <laughs> I don't think I'm the resolution sorry, is that best. <laughs> <laughs> it's got two heads. So you're desperate for someone. I am desperate for someone heavily pregnant to come along. So if you know anyone who's heavily pregnant and they can still manage stairs because our, our room is, uh, is at the stairs. Yeah. Waddle, waddle. Yeah. Drag them along or yeah. ideally they'll want to come along. Yeah, yeah, bring them along to yeah. learn about space. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I'm hosting the first night. Um, the first night we are doing um, an astronomy themed music quiz, mm-hmm. which will be fun. Um, then we're doing bingo, I think, on the second night, but with the periodic table, so oh, chemistry okay. bingo. So mm-hmm. that's going to be fun. Um, and then the third night we've got name that scientist. So we're going to show people pictures of scientists and uh, See if you can recognise who it is. And there are prizes! That's what we were waiting for. Are oh, there are prizes. I know, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. No. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, of course there are prizes. I'm not, telling you what... <laughs> I'm not telling you what the prizes are, though. You've got to come along and win to find out what the prizes are. Okay, there's incentive. Tickets are on Eventbrite. If you just Google Pint of Science UK, mm-hmm. they'll come up there Look as well. Look for the Cardiff one, because that's the important one. Look for the Cardiff one. And if you go on the Cardiff one, for some reason, our event is right at the bottom of the listing, hmm. even though it's the most important event. So yeah, scroll hmm. all the way down to the bottom of the page. I've also noticed you can even just Google um, Pint of Science Millard, and it comes up. Hot damn. Oh, look at that. Google that. That's hmm. even better. Yeah. yeah. Pint of Science Millard. Hmm. Tickets cool. are £4. So it's all right, isn't it, for like two hours entertainment? Yeah. Pretty good. Bargain. Bargain. And you might be at the and frontier crap, of science. And then you'll want your money back. It won't be crap though if you're at the frontier of science and you find out that infrared cameras do show up the outline babies of a fetus yeah. or a baby. In, 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 mm. I, I want to know if that's true. Yeah. I want to know if it's true. Mm. So find someone who's heavily pregnant and drag them in. Mm. <laughs> Don't do that. You! Yeah. In here now! <laughs> you are with child. Come into this pub. Okay, so now we move on to the news, and it's been a big month in astronomy news. So, Paul, do you want to start us off? Okay, well, I'm going to start us off with some Hubble. Um, This is a problem that we have with cosmic expansion. Um, So, based on Planck data, the early universe, the data we have for the current rate of expansion is not what's predicted. So, ooh, exactly. So, if you look at the remember Planck, the European Space Agency satellite, um, what it showed the, the sort of rate of expansion was, and then therefore then should be if it if it's a sort of a constant, isn't what we see. In fact, it's greater by a factor of nine percent. Oh, okay. Which is quite big. I mean, if it was a few, you know, like... Like 1%. 1%, half percent, percent, you'd go like, yeah, something wrong with the data. Yeah. There's like, there's an error somewhere. Yeah, it's it's some... probably... Yeah, exactly. No, 9%. This is, this is quite significant. So the chance of this were previously put down to a, a 3,000 to 1, though, that this was a kind of chance thing, mm. that this was a, an error, essentially, that this was just right. a fluke and a, yeah. it, it's actually... It's not... So it was pretty. So sure, we're pretty confident that this difference was a real difference. That this yeah. is true. Because three thousand to one, you know, they're, they're big odds. Oh, yeah. So the the problem um, is, of course, the good old cosmic distance ladder, um, or just how far away are the things we're looking at? Because if you want to know how f- if something's moving away, you want to know how far away it is, so you can measure the mm. distance, speed, and things like that. So that clearly, if you don't know how far away something is, you don't get an accurate measurement of. I think I would be useful for that. that. Big what? A big guy. Oh, guy. I thought you said big guy would be useful for that. Like, <laughs> big guy? Well, he's probably a bit taller. <laughs> a bit, <laughs> yeah, big guy. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, Gaia. I mean, Gaia is going to be the gift that just keeps giving. But I think you know we're, we're still really in the early days of Gaia, and so I mean, the, the Gaia data is just fast. And I think the stuff's going to come out of that. But this this actually goes back to good old Hubble. Yeah, exactly. So. Ooh. Ooh. Um, I, think, I think the ooze have died yeah, I think, I think yeah. um, and so it's, 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 it's that big surprise that especially when I'm talking the laymen don't realise that astronomers don't really know how far away things really are it's very difficult to know yeah. how far away something is we, we know the nearest stars reasonably accurately but even the nearest stars are still a, mm. quite a big error even bar Google struggles with that yeah exactly mm. exactly um, so if you can refine this cosmic ladder, then you will get better distance measurements and therefore a better grip on this um, expansion problem. So the basic ladder, of course, is um, Cepheid variables, Henrietta Swan-Levitt um, fame. So get these uh, to get this sort of super accurate, um, and the ladder will follow. Basically, yeah, if you get your, your variables right, these stars that change their their magnitude and you know that they do it regularly and therefore the same star and you get the distance get that right you can prove your ladder so that's what they've done um and the team led by nobel astronomer adam reese um has a thing called sh- uh, i hate myself even <laughs> saying it all right shoe spelt with a zero <laughs> that is not bad is it's that? supernovae h zero for the equation of state yeah, I know. Yeah, why do they come up with the why acronyms to begin? Why shoes? Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. Yes, anyway, yes. it annoys the hell out of me. But anyway, <laughs> and they think it's funny. They really should stop. No, it's so that, that, that's, that's, It's not funny. As a genre, quite really. <sighs> anyway, by using data from Hubble, backed up by ground-based telescopes, they've looked at the distances to these, these variables in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and by using better data processing and things, they've actually halved the uncertainty. They've gone from 2.5% uncertainty to the distance to 1.3. Oh, okay. Wow. Which doesn't sound a lot to if you, but oh. that's significant. You know, they've yeah, yeah. halved the uncertainty. Yeah. So suddenly they've made the scale far more accurate. Um, and it's what they've done is that they, they've basically. The, the Planck data and the predictions and what we measure, this is real. It's almost certainly real. It's not a result of spurious data and the fact that it's two different experiments and two different measurements, things like that. It is actually a real thing. And in fact, to the point where they now say the odds are 100,000 to one that this is a coincidence, a, a cock-up or whatever. It, it, yeah. This is not... So... Rees said, um, this is not just two experiments disagreeing. We are measuring something fundamentally different. One is a measurement of how fast the universe is expanding today as we see it. The other is a prediction based on the physics of the early universe and on the measurements of how fast it ought to be going, or expanding. If these values don't agree, there becomes a very strong likelihood that we're missing something in the cosmological model that connects the two eras. So what he's saying is basically there is something we don't understand about Big Bang and the expansion of the universe. There is there is something has changed. The universe is different. Mm. That's exciting. It's very exciting that yeah. it was it was like this at the beginning. It is different now. It is not something that has been constant. Because for so many years, it's kind of been locked down. You know that. Oh yeah, we know what's happening. We know Big Bang. We know now. We know Hubble constant. Blah blah blah. Everyone's exactly. Been pretty hunky dory, and and uh, now they're saying. Yeah, I, I remember back in the 90s when they, they nailed down Big Bang and they, they did that. It was all over there. It was the Independent, I think, ran that big front page with the with the Big Bang picture, the famous, you know, the, the cone. And that was on the front page newspaper in, in, in Britain um, that this was, you know, we've nailed down how. So, yeah, it, this is saying, you know, do you know what? There's a bit missing. There's a, there's a, there's something we don't get completely. And Adam Rees does have a little bit of a track record of finding things that aren't, or, mm. or, or showing us that what we thought the universe was like isn't because he was one of the guys that got the Nobel Prize for dark energy, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, this, this is... Showing us that 90% of the universe, we don't know what it is. So if you if you want this, uh, you can chase this story down at Astrophysics Journal, and it's called the Large Magic... Blah, 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 blah. It's this gin. It's good gin. <laughs> Large Magellanic Cloud Cepheid standards provide a 1% foundation for the determination of the Hubble constant and stronger evidence for physics beyond lambda CDM. CDM being, of course, cold, dark matter. Was there any comment in the paper about the results from gravitational waves? I didn't notice how this ties in, because there's been this discrepancy with gravitational waves. They've been saying 
no, 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 it's, it's this value. Mm-hmm. And then all the things from the Cephids, they've been like, no, 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 it's this value. And then Planck sits happily in between going, I like both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just data. Yeah, do with me I, what you will. I, I, I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I didn't read the entire paper, skimmed it um, for the news. Um, so it may be, I don't know. I didn't read the whole thing. Um, it was quite long. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, exactly, and and They're very dense. And yeah, 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 and and I'm not a full time one yeah. of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my. It's not my job. Um, even even full time one of me, we almost never read the entire paper. Yeah, abstract and summary. You start yeah, abstract with the abstract, conclusion. and then you might look at the introduction, <laughs> you look at the plots, and then you look at the conclusion. I, I think the last time I read a full paper was when I was doing my degree, and I just, like, read the whole paper just because you something, and then I've never done it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so possibly I don't know. I never got that that far into it. Just all the interesting bits, um, and it was really interesting. Um, so yeah, that that's really cool. So next up is Cassini. Remember Cassini? Oh, seemed like it would never leave us, always there, giving us those magnificent views of Saturn, pouring out science like fine wine. Oh, those were the days. Or oh, gin, in fact. Gin, I need another gin. Let's have a cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Well, despite the absence um, that sci- this, the science is still being churned through and giving astronomers new insights, and this time it's everyone's favourite atmosphered moon, Titan. Um, so two papers in Nature Astronomy have used Cassini data to reveal more about these anabatic lakes of methane, if you remember the, the, the big discovery. So some, it appears, are up to 300 feet deep, oh my which is quite deep. Yeah. It's yeah. like 100 metres deep. Oh my yeah, yeah, these that are deep. They are significant bodies of water. Well, well, well water ish, ish, methane. because <laughs> the really interesting thing is they're really deep. But they've got very small surface area, so they're very small. Mm. This, this is why it's a very interesting paper because they, they appear to be very small bodies just from a kind of mapping point of view. But they go down. But they go down really deep, um, and this happens on Earth. This is called a, a karstic lake, um, which is where water eats away at things like limestone. So you get a small lake, what appears to be a small lake, Brilliant. but it goes very very deep down underneath, mm. um, and. These are found on Titan. They appear to be found in the sort of highlands, like up in the hills. These things. So they, these like sit on top of hills and basically eat down through these hills. So I think it's methane. That's it's methane. Yeah. So it's methane eating into the the, the volatile ices mm. that are, are kind of there. And it's so lots of very interesting, lots of sort of research to do there on why that's happening and then the action that's actually you know we understand the one on Earth, but what's going on on Titan? But basically, the the data showed this that these lakes are appear small, but actually are very very deep. Um, then there was another paper um, about these lakes, and the this one was looking at phantom lakes. Um, this really demonstrates the benefit of a long-term mission, um, because of course, um, Cassini was there for thirteen years. So these are these lakes that, on the first passes, when when Cassini was first there, it, it took pictures of these lakes, and we saw these lakes. Over the thirteen years of the mission, they vanished, and they're not there now. Um, we've talked a bit about this before, haven't we? We, we talked about the um, there was a big lake that changed shape, and there was yes. Uh, yes. Do you remember? So this was, is all connected. With that. This is, must be all connected with that. Yeah, exactly. It's all sort of the explanations of why various bits disappeared mm-hmm. and changed. Well, they think it's because they're actually just very, very shallow, very shallow lakes, and because it was there for thirteen years, it actually crossed seasons. That the the seasonal cycle of of Titan is the same as Saturn, so it's a thirty year cycle. So you know, sort of yeah. summer, summer, spring, winter, autumn, how you want to think about it, it, takes 30 years. 13 years means, of course, it's, you know, that's more than a third of that cycle. So it saw different seasons parts. and yeah, different yeah. times. So, um, and they think these lakes basically evaporated. So it means they were very, very shallow, so very vulnerable mm. to this sort of seasonal change. So a little bit yeah. of heating up, off they've gone, yeah. they've evaporated. Um, so it, it, again, shows the importance of this sort of, a big mission that takes that you know it's not over years not just yeah, a snapshot it's not the you, to, to borrow a rant from last thing it's not the Apollo going there for three days and picking mm. up a rock and coming home however important that is it's actually putting a thing to observe for 13 years and yeah. actually see these we wouldn't have seen that otherwise yeah. and that that's you know we've learned that wasn't something. spending 13 years around Titan that no was, that was spending 13 years around Saturn, Saturn exactly. and getting occasional glimpses of yeah. Uh, Titan. yeah, exactly. So if you want to follow these up, these are in Astronomy Nature, both of them, and they were deep and methane-rich lakes on Titan. I know, that's what it says on the tin. Mm-hmm. And the case for seasonal surface changes at Titan's Lake District, 
likewise pretty clear on that one mm -hmm. nice titles nice titles um, my last piece is going back to good old LIGO hey, the gravity it's died, it? it's died. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, Gravitational wave detector is is out of refit, um, and it's doing its thing again. And what a thing! Um, its third run is yield a detection in just two days. They switched it on yeah, two, days later, two days later. Ping! Yeah. It's it's yeah. got one, um, and then it happened a few hours later. They got two detections within like bing bing like that. Um, and you remember? I mean, you remember those discussions we had about. Is, Lido is, even is it gonna to work? Is yeah, it yeah. even gonna happen? Years before it oh god! And now, now it's like we turn it on. Oh, there, there. it's uh, just incredible. Um, so that was two days. They had a couple of detections, um, and then in a month they had three detections around the world with the other detectors combined with all the. De they've now got five detections since they've turned LIGO back. So that was five in a month. Oh, it's boring. Now. There's only four, there's only fourteen so far. Five of them are just like in a month. Yeah. So oh, there's like it's like it's suddenly like boom, <laughs> we're there, we've got yeah. this. Um, so it's going to accelerate really quickly. They reckon with this new refit, we're looking at detection every week. Brilliant. So yeah, you know it's just partner. and that's just LIGO without the other detectors. So you know by the end of the year we're going to be you know yeah. dozens and dozens of these things within a couple of years. There'll be hundreds. Of this is going to feed into so many branches yeah. of astronomy. Oh. Be able to, well, this to things. settle that whole Hubble constant yes, exactly. thing because if they're getting you know detections every week then because they need I think they needed something like um, 20 neutron star mergers in order to reasonably constrain it because you mm. need the electromagnetic part so that you can accurately determine mm. the distance to the merger so yeah talking to people sort of in the department they reckon they need about 20 to get the error bars down to something reasonable mm. and, so, and are these neutron star mergers or are these well hole? actually these ones are all black hole they think so these these ones they detected are all black hole so ones more so, sensitive or it needs yeah, to be, the, we need the, to the know neutron, that it can still pick up at this sensitivity neutron yeah, star mergers I think the neutron star one is going to take a bit bit longer to, mm. to kind of get to grips with because it, it is going to be weaker because yeah. they're not yes. as not as massive massive bodies exactly yeah. But we're on that route. That's yeah, the exactly. really cool thing. Yeah. We're on that yeah. route. Um, so the upgrade's clearly working. Um, and so, yeah, exciting times. And that's me done. Jen. We're starting with a nifty little story. You can tell because I've used the word nifty. Oh, God. <laughs> right. I'm going to start with a nifty little story about measuring the size of something. I'm sure we'll all agree. Size is very important. Absolutely. Size is absolutely important. And Sean no, it's, not. it's not. No, size doesn't <laughs> You might say that. I no, think it's very important. Well. I'm well. confident, Mel. <laughs> Astronomers agree wholeheartedly with this statement and have recently managed to accurately measure the size of a star some 2,700 light years away. And the data was taken with Veritas, which is the Very Energetic Radiation Imaging Telescope Array System. That's Sounds a reasonable acronym. Yeah, that one, that one, that one, that one, because it means a proper word, Veritas, goddess of truth. Yeah, yeah. so it's, like yeah, it's a pretty good acronym, right? Um, and this is a ground-based gamma ray observatory. Um, the way they did this was by waiting for an asteroid to occult a star. Uh, that is, for the asteroid to pass in front of the star and block out some of its light for a short amount of time. The astronomers timed how long it took for the light of the star to dim and then brighten again, then combined this with the speed of the asteroid, and then this allows them to work out the diameter of the star. Mm. So we are actually measuring the size of a star mm. 2,700 light years away. Mm. I think that's amazing. I yeah. love that, isn't it? Really brilliant, brilliant, and again, mm. it shows that occultations deliver so much more than people realize yeah. in terms of science. Yeah, so the asteroid in question was Impruneta, which is about 60 kilometers wide or 37 miles if you prefer old money. And the diameter of the star was determined to be about 11 times that of our own sun. And the star in question has now actually been reclassified as a red giant, cool, yeah, because it's now much bigger than it was originally <laughs> thought to be. Mm. Now, the team managed to do this again with a star that was a bit closer, about 700 light years away from Earth, with 88 kilometer wide asteroid Penelope. And the size of this star was determined to just be 2.2 times that of our own sun. And that has smashed the record for the smallest stellar diameter oh. ever measured. Yeah. Awesome. 2.2 times the size of our own sun. Just, just a thought. Will this help us with that cosmic ladder thing again? Because if we know the intrinsic brightness and things of those stars and then we know actually how like we we, we improve our recognition of them and how far away they and what their 
I'm not making sense, it's gin. Um, <laughs> this diameter, that we'd actually be able to improve the distance because of the brightness and we'll know how big they actually are. Yeah, and... because once you know the size of them, you can work mm. out how intrinsically bright they are. You can that, see... That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just build your tolerance back up, Paul. Yeah, God. Well, so we need to do more of these measurements yeah, because then... on Cepheid variables. I mean, maybe. The problem is with that is that would be great. However, the chance likelihood of getting an mm, asteroid aligned mm, perfectly yeah. with a star yeah. is rare. So, yeah. You these, take your chances where you can. Yeah, yeah. You just, you see that it's going to occult something and you go, bugger it, go for it. It doesn't matter what sort of star mm. it is. We just need to know. But yeah, we can tighten up then our knowledge of, because the luminosity of star is related to its temperature and yeah, also its yeah. size. Mm. Now, the peak temperature, we can figure out the temperature, sorry, we can figure out reasonably accurately because it's based on the peak wavelength of mm -hmm. emission. Simple spectroscopy. Yeah, you, you just, um, you image the star at many different wavelengths, you make a plot wherever the peak is, that's where the temperature mm -hmm. is. Um, so that we can work out reasonably accurately. But the size of a star is a very different thing. So if we can work out the sizes of these stars, mm -hmm. we can know how bright they are intrinsically, measure how bright they appear, and then that can give us a distance because, you know, Things that are close are bright and things that are far are dim. Literally. Yeah. So. Yeah. So now, second story, I'm going to stay beyond our borders and I'm going to talk about the possible detection of a comet in another star system. Get out of here. No, 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 it's good. Oh, I've not read this. No, 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 no it's good. Ooh, <laughs> that's bad, yeah, that's yeah, that's bad. bad. It's, bad. it's good. It's good, Get right? Out of here. We've only just got a. Have we spotted an exo moon? Now we've got an exo comet. An exo comet, <laughs> yep. So this is a team led by S. Zeba. Don't know the first name, unfortunately. It's it was, it yeah. might just be S. S is a really cool name, so yeah. let's just go with S. Yeah. From uh, Universitat Innsbruck, um, and they found evidence of a comet around Beta Pictoris using data from TESS. Oh, the Transiting oh. Exoplanet Survey? Satellites, Satellite. yeah. Ah. yeah. So over 105 days, the team found three distinctive dipping events in the light output of Beta Victoris. Now, I like this star. I know about this star because I've studied it myself using ah. Herschel. It's a very young star. It's only a few tens, maybe 100 million years old, and it's got a very prominent ring of dust around it, which could actually be forming planets. So it's a very young system. So it's quite interesting that it's yeah. got these these comets and like this material mm. going around it. That's a super fast orbit, though. That's going to be really close in, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, the dips themselves are irregular in terms of their depth and their duration. So, you get a dimming of up to two days. Some of them are at two days. Some of them are less than two days um, in terms of the duration of the dip and the light output. And then the amount of light that's blocked out varies from 0 0.5 to 2,000th of a fraction of the overall light output of the star. Mm. Um when you get a transient exoplanet, the form of the dip is very regular. You um, you have kind of a quite quick decrease as the exoplanet starts to transit. You have a reasonably flat bottom where the light output that's blocked out is reasonably constant. And then you have this like quickly then as it's exiting the profile of the star, the light output goes back up to normal. Everything's very uniform. It's very predictable. This is assuming that you don't have any like sunspots and things like mm. that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whereas, whereas these, I've had a look at them, and they kind of look like triangles, the dips. And they're like maybe slightly off-center triangles, and like the triangle sides might be a bit curved. And they're completely different, so it's definitely not a planet. It's something different again. And it can't be a sunspot. No, because it's so regular. Yeah. That's, mm. that's the yeah, name, because sunspots, sunspots yeah. come and go. They, they would change as well, even, even yeah. if a sunspot makes it all the way around the star, it mm. would have changed what it yeah, what so it's the like output, significantly in that time. Yeah. 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 The dimming would have been different. Yeah. So the way they figured out that it's probably an exocomet is by fitting a model. The best fitting model happens to be an exocomet. Mm. And they think it's an evaporating comet that's got an extended tail um, and that is passing in front of mm -hmm. the star from our point of view. So then as the sort of emission, the evaporation from this comet is changing, then we're getting different amounts of light blocked out. It's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. Incredible. And what else can TESS do then if it can do this? I know, right? Because no we're, we're this. only a few months into TESS. Yeah. And uh, yeah, TESS is the underdog. Mm. No one talks about no, TESS. It's like no they Kepler, just don't. but it might yeah. well end well, up being something incredibly who, revolutionary. Who put it up? Who's... SpaceX put it up. Space, is it, space, yeah, it went up on a Falcon. Yeah, whose mm. who's is it? It's, it's NASA. Yes, yeah. NASA. It's NASA. Yeah. It's NASA. Yeah. 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 But yeah cool. So I like that story. I thought, mm, mm, this is good. This is a good story. I missed that one as well. So, I'm going to finish off 
my section of the news by reviewing some of the brilliant April Fool's jokes <laughs> 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 that went out on the archive this year because it turns out even sometimes scientists have a sense of humour. Who knew, Beautiful. right? Okay, so the first step is acronym. Mm-hmm. The acronym... <laughs> yeah, Paul's just yeah. like smacked his head on the table at this. <laughs> so <laughs> the first step is acronym, which stands for acronym creation for you and me and so i just like to point out where the letters come from it's the a in acronym the cr and the on in creation and then the y and the m in you and me now this is a command line piece of code that will generate an acronym for you if you give it a phrase and better yet it doesn't matter where the letters appear in your words just like a true astronomer. <laughs> so it can make it just as crap as that one. <laughs> yep, yeah. So if anyone is interested, you can install this bit of code using um, pip install acronym. Um, if you're on a Linux or a Mac system, if it's on Windows, I'm not sure mm-hmm. what it is because I've never I've never done it on Windows. Uh, so the next time your boss wants you to come up with a new project name, <laughs> save everyone three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Spend 10 minutes on this program and I'm sure everyone will happily buy your pint when they get to leave two hours early on Friday. Except for Paul, who... How yeah. they chin you on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great because the words that they come up with for the acronym are words in the English language. So they're genuine <laughs> words. They just pick random letters out of the phrase that you give it. It's well, brilliant. that's a hell of a, an April Fool's because you would imagine that that would have yeah. just been something that came out, but they didn't actually do the work behind yeah. it to create yeah, yeah, yeah. it. It actually works. That's the best thing. Like, <laughs> it, like it actually, we sat there for about half an hour putting in various things and it was brilliant. I need another gym. <laughs> <laughs> So next we have Adiv Paradise and The Long Night Modelling the Climate of Westeros. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... and I like sci-fi. I know, right. It's good, though. It's good, though. So as I'm sure any Game of Thrones fans are aware, winter has come. But why has winter come? Now, let's face it, Westeros... I mean, I'm, I'm looking at you two like, oh yeah, Westeros. You know about Westeros. Sorry, Do you guys I'm, watch? Hang on, hang on. Look, you're shaking your head like I'm going to make noise. Everyone knows we're drinking gin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this one's got a pass. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kevin. Do you watch Game of Thrones? I've watched one series of it and just threw oh, it out Ralph. of my mind. I can't, oh, can't get no. there. Oh, God. No, mm. no. Right, well, you two can just it's stop got, listening got, to this bit. Right, dragons in it. Oh, it's brilliant. I think someone put on Twitter, um, recreate Game of Thrones by watching Lord of the Rings, pausing it every 10 minutes to watch a couple of minutes of porn, and then starting Lord <laughs> of the Rings again. Someone drew parallels between Lord of, uh, not Lord of the Rings, between Game of Thrones and Shrek. They, <laughs> <laughs> they're the various characters, like you put them side by side and they look like the characters in Game of Thrones. Anyhow, back to the story. No, so mm. Westeros, you would know if you watch a show, mm. but it has a very weird climate. You know if you don't, because there's enough people who <laughs> bang on that. Oh, yeah. So, the Westeros uh, climate is normally Earth-like, but then every few thousand years you get this really terrible winter. So why? Is it the Night King? I mean, eh, could be, but maybe not. So it could be described by what is known as a Sitnikov configuration. So imagine, if you will, you've got two stars which are in the same orbital plane, so their orbits are kind of flat with respect to each other, but they're orbiting a common centre of mass. So it's not like one big star and a little star and the little one's orbiting the big one. They're about the same sort of mass and so mm. they're orbiting this mm. common centre of mass. So imagine that their their orbits trace out circles yeah. and those circles overlap a bit like a Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how uh, the yeah, how yeah, the yeah, orbits yeah, 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 look, yeah, a bit like a Venn diagram, that would right? Be cool. That'd yeah, cool. that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. And it, in such a situation, there's actually a stable orbit which is perpendicular to the orbits of these stars. So it just goes up and down mm-hmm. straight through the middle of the Venn diagram um, so people say that that could explain the climate um, but in order for it to really work you need some sort of mega structure oh, oh no oh, not a mega structure I again. know yeah to protect the planet um, when it's sort of in line with the orbits of the stars right because otherwise it would just get too hot and it would burn and bake so the idea with this orbit is that you get this terrible winter when the planet is far away from the stars yeah um, and then the mega structure stops it burning <laughs> when it's sort of in the plane of the stellar orbits um no one likes this. The authors of this paper didn't like this. <laughs> uh, so what they said is probably more believable is some sort of chaotic variation of the planet's tilt or its semi-major axis um, may be caused by other planets or nearby stars 
so that it's just orbiting a normal star rather than having like this two two star system um and it's just like going akimbo because maybe there's a second star that's orbiting further out and every you know few thousand years it pulls on on the planet and, and causes its orbit to change or it's been given a good thump by a passing planet at some point in its past and now its tilt varies a lot something like that but yeah so i thought that was quite interesting so this is basically an april fools figuring yeah. out how the world in game of thrones could actually work yeah 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 so finally i'm gonna leave you all with some homework and invite you to go to archive and look up Tess photometric mapping of a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone by Rodrigo Luger. And in this paper, the team of used light reflected from an exoplanet to map the surface features of the rocky world, finding oceans <laughs> and continents. <laughs> and the jury is out as to whether there's any intelligent life on the surface, but you guys can be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So some of you might be thinking that there's a certain rather important recent discovery missing so far, and that's because we're going to cover it all together in our big news story for this month, and that is the first ever image of a black hole. Now, unless you've been living in a in black, black hole, hole. <laughs> or, or under a rock for the past month, you will definitely have seen this image. Um, so, guys, who wants to go first on telling us? Well, let's, let's start with how this was detected. Oh. Can I just say, I yelped when I saw the picture. Did you? I actually did, with, with being slightly sexist, a little girly yelp. And you could tell the guy that was announcing yeah, it. I, I was just... Oh. It was like, I'm having to really hold myself in here. I'm really excited. Oh, yeah. We were watching one of the press releases, and the press release that we watched was not great. I can't remember which um, institute it was. But they were doing this thing where they were, you know, speaking to the various people. You know, everyone gets like three minutes and they say their piece. And then they're saying things like, you know, as you can see on the screen behind me, and they'd show these images, but they would just stay on this guy's face. So yeah, yeah, we didn't see anything until they started like putting links to all the images and all the pictures and yeah, it was yeah. a pain in the bum. Because of course you can't actually see a black hole because it's black. Yeah, so all you can do is image the accretion disk you can image what's getting heated mm. up before and then there, was, there was a whole they were using this phrase a shadow mm. Mm. and there was a big debate wasn't there about well actually do they mean silhouette or do they mean actually is it, is it a shadow is it a silhouette there was actually a bit of debate about mm. what 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 it is we were seeing mm. uh, which which I don't think ever everyone's quite resolved in that respect about what word we should be using mm. yeah because what you're seeing is the last stable orbit yes. I believe of the accretion disk that's what that black gap in the middle is is mm. the black hole is much smaller than that yeah it's yeah. much much smaller about five five times smaller in terms of diameter mm. i think um but what you're seeing is the edge of the last stable orbit so this is the it, sort of the point of no return in terms of matter and light it it's it's like the the inner edge is where things can happily sit and orbit the black hole but as soon as they get any closer they just fall mm. into the black hole so that's what that gap is mm -hmm. and that's superheated gas and yeah. dust that's, yeah. that's six in the death spiral billion Calvin six billion six, <laughs> six billion that's mind blowing you can't even consider no, that because our sun is about six thousand Calvin yeah six thousand yeah like billion. this is six billion it's incomprehensible like, <laughs> Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's yeah. just, yeah, those numbers are disgusting. And you know, another number that's disgusting is that it took five petabytes of data to get this image. Mm. And the team managed to compress five petabytes of data down to a few hundred kilobytes. What? For the output image. You know that image yeah, that yeah, you see? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the output image. That's just a few hundred kilobytes. A few hundred kilobytes. Mm. Which has to be some kind of record in terms of data yeah, compression, yeah. right? Five petabytes. Yes. And they could have just watched Interstellar. Yes. Because actually, and that was, that was yeah. the one of the things that struck was like, God, that was good. That was yeah. pretty spot on, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they got that right. Yeah. Another thing I like about this whole discovery is that, um, so I, we'll talk about all the different telescopes that mm. were used in this discovery, but one of them was a South Pole telescope. And with the South Pole telescope, people rock up and then they don't leave until a year afterwards. So they were taking the data and the data was literally put onto CDs and sat there 
for about five months. Wow. Seriously. Seriously, and then sat there for about five months or so until the ship came to pick everyone up. And then and then everything was shipped That's back to. It's not incredible. networked, or well, they can't transmit. There's it no at that no. Speed. There's no cable. Oh. Everything yeah. is put onto hard copies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and then is shipped out. You need out. a tanker for all the CDs that it's put onto. Yeah, it's yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, I liked that. The fact that you know these people working at the South Pole Telescope have got all this data. Just like, can you imagine if someone spilled a cup of coffee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one of the CDs cracked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. They didn't need that one. <laughs> but yeah, I guess one big question is that um, why M87 and not the black hole in the Milky Way? Right? Mm-hmm. Why? Surely our one is much closer. Why M87? Yeah. Yeah, so just, just why? clarify. M87 mm-hmm. is the galaxy, the elliptical galaxy that, that the, they the black imaged hole. for this. Yeah. yeah. M87 is... Well, massive black hole in the middle of it. I mean, yeah. lots of listeners probably have looked at it because mm. it is huge. I mean, it's yeah. it's the it's the it's one of the biggies in the Virgo cluster. Mm-hmm. So you And you can't miss it. And it's one of those when you... You're jumping around the Virgo cluster, doing the other night, and you kind of come across M87. And you're like, "Whoa, that's mm. big!" Well, because it's not in magnitude. I mean, it's magnitude seven, so it's yeah. it's it's one of the brighter galaxies out there to observe. Exactly, you're, you're, you're you sort of hopping. You're hopping around the kind of the little galaxies mm. that you see all over the Virgo cluster, and then you're like, "Wow, that's really cool! Look, there's a big cluster of galaxies. There's three there. It's four there. It's four there." And then suddenly, like, "Whoa, yeah. what the hell is that?" <laughs> it's, it's M87. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's vast. Galaxies. I mean, it's so big. I think I was reading that it's got. Um, so the the Milky Way, which is a, a large sized galaxy, mm. has got something between 100 and 200 globular clusters orbiting mm. around it. This has got thousands of globular clusters orbiting around it. It's an absolutely massive galaxy. Mm-hmm. It is a monster. They call it a super elliptical, I think. Yeah, it's huge. It's absolutely massive. And that's one of the reasons why they went for M87. I mean, they have been looking at the Milky Way as well. And the data for the Milky Way is going to come out mm. sooner rather than later. But... M87 was the first release because the black hole at the centre is much more massive, Mm. basically. Mm. And so it's a lot easier to image. Also, what you've got to think about when we're in our galaxy, we've got a lot of crap in the way. We've got a lot of detail and things that we can resolve within our galaxy that they're going to have to sift through Mm. and pull Mm -hmm. out and decide, Mm -hmm. is this black hole data? Is this something that's sitting in front of it? Whereas when you're looking at M87 it's a lot easier to disentangle that information because we're not going to get the sort of resolution and we're just going to kind of be able to see through everything there's um, because M87 is an elliptical galaxy there's less gas and things like that elliptical galaxies are sometimes called red and dead galaxies Mm. they've pretty much exhausted their supply of gas um, probably because of merger events that happened Mm. a few million or billion years ago and those merger events are very chaotic and Mm. they um, spark huge amounts of star formation which then literally kind of burns through all the gas that you've got so there's less of that stuff to kind of disentangle. So it means it's more stable really doesn't it? Yeah it's yeah exactly that is another thing about the Milky Way black hole is that mm. it's at the, this, these were tidbits from sort of a, a mini press conference that we had in Cardiff but they're saying that the black hole at the Milky Way, they're expecting to be a lot more chaotic and to mm. vary, uh, to vary yeah. on very short time scales of days. Whereas if you go and look at the results of this, the black hole is very mm. stable and they looked at it over several yeah. days and it changed very, very I, little in those times. I, am I right? They, they were talking about that the, the Milky Way one potentially is a bit more edge on in terms of the disk. Yeah. So actually it's going to be harder to get any sort of meaningful image as well because I think just because of our vantage they, point. they wanted to give give the world essentially that image that's that yeah. that was part of, I think they, they were actually quite wise to the kind of you know we've spent a lot of money on this this is here but here's the image this is what we want to see whereas actually the Milky Way one they, it potentially wouldn't make sense initially it'd be like this sort of messy edge on kind of chaotic well you're thing just going to see a strip of light yeah there, exactly right? they were like that's that. it whereas actually they picked one that even if you didn't quite, have it, it's a black hole. You know, it it, it actually is quite quite. It's, it's, right it's going to become an iconic it image. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly yeah. kind of, and they were actually, I think, were quite wise in that as well. Mm. Yeah, because what you're looking at when you're looking at the M eighty seven image is you've got that bright bit at the mm. front. That's the actual emission that you're seeing from this accretion disk, and then the stuff opposite to that is like the back of the accretion disk, mm. which would normally be blocked out by the black hole, but because 
the sort of distortion of space time is so great near the mm. black hole it's literally reflecting the light up like bringing it up mm. bending yeah, the light yeah. rays yeah. so that you can see the back of that accretion disk which is why it doesn't necessarily look how you think a disk might look if you're mm. looking at it at an angle that's why it's got this slightly weird shape but mm. Mm. it's insane yeah and it's once again cool. it proves Einstein right yeah <laughs> you know we were talking about LIGO earlier and gravitational waves it proves Einstein right oh, in, in that I'm ready area. for him and to be taken down a peg or two <laughs> <laughs> too big for that moustache yeah well done well done, well done Einstein yeah well. boring come <laughs> on no brilliant I mean yeah. the genius the yeah. genius of of I, the thing is, it's not just him. It's the genius. He he is the sort of the tip of the spear of a group of people who yes. who worked this out and from he, his equations, yeah. but also beforehand. So you're going back to things like you know, Maxwell and things like oh, that. Okay, you know, yeah, yeah. Sort of, he he is that that kind of if you like the ultimate representative of that entire field of everything that came together, and he he stitched the final bit together and say like very this poetic. yeah there we go mm. um, but actually yeah that that whole late 19th century early 20th century science that that he is the kind of representative of it, it's being proved right again mm. so should we talk a little bit about how the science was done oh very or, briefly very, very much <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so um, in order to get the image um, you've probably heard them say oh yeah we turned earth into a telescope mm. right which they did they, they did, did actually, yeah. yeah yeah so what they did is they used a technique called interferometry which um, you essentially instead of having one giant telescope you use telescopes that are spaced mm. certain distances apart and then those telescopes themselves when you put all the data together become a giant telescope which has the diameter of the distance between the telescopes how it works, don't ask me, because it's very complicated and very hard, and I've never done it myself. But it's very well known, very well understood, and well, people have been doing yes, radio telescopes you know for the, the decades. The next day, I went to where it was invented. Get out of here. Yeah, do you know what? It was really cool. Um, it's... Um, we have a thing in, in Britain called the National Trust that run all these sort of, you know, look after all the houses and castles and like that. Anything um, that's sort of of interest. Of interest. In Chatsworth UK. House is where they're no, they, This was at Croom in, um, it's in Worcestershire. And I didn't know, I, I, get me out of the house. I do get out of the house, but you know, this sort of like, we're going, we're going to this place. There's a, there's a museum there about the, the, like the RAF thing that was there. I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, go on, I'll, I'll look at that. And there was an RAF base there during the war called RAF Defford, which is where they pioneered radar. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's this big collection of experts who, who looked at radar and stuff like that. And they were the people who picked up on things like the cosmic wave early on, that kind of, you know, the interference mm -hmm. and stuff. They would realise that they were picking up meteors in the atmosphere and stuff like that. Yeah. After the war, they took the RAF base, the, then the guy stayed there. They put railway lines down the two runways mounted two radio telescopes on these railway lines and moved them backwards and forwards on these See railway that. lines to create a bigger and smaller telescope oh, of different yeah genius I was, I, I was in this thing going this is awesome look at this this is where they made this is where it happened this yeah. is where it started the journey to the black hole is here Yeah, it was very cool anyway that was a little side RF Defford that's where it happened there you go what's the shit so the telescopes that they used were scattered all across the globe and the idea oh. behind this was that so that as the Earth rotates and your different parts of the Earth go in between night and day, you can get continuous coverage of the black hole. Mm -hmm. um, and they stretched the pairs of telescopes all sorts of different distances, actually. And I think that's something that people might not think about. Some of the telescopes are actually reasonably close together. Um, some of them were the entire diameter of the Earth, pretty much. So some of the telescopes involved, so you've got JCMT, which is the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, mm. which is on Hawaii. Um, you've got the LMT, the Large Millimeter Telescope. You've got ALMA. You've got, what does ALMA stand for? Atacama Large I'm Millimeter Array. 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 Yeah. I yeah. where that is. <laughs> uh, you've got the South Pole Telescope. Um, well, where's that then? I don't, <laughs> don't know. Who knows? Um, yeah, all sorts of different ones. And... Um, then the distances, so the telescopes were sort of lined up in pairs so that they would work together as the Earth was rotating mm. and those mm. sites mm. happened to be in darkness. And the importance of doing telescopes with different distances apart is to give you different scales yeah. in terms of your resolution. So if you have, I've got to get this right now, if they're very close, I've got to think about this now. Hang on. Yeah, if they're very close together, then you can resolve large structures. Yes, it's, 
yeah, poor you're resolution. Poor resolution. Large things, yeah. If they're very far apart, then you can resolve the small things. And what they need to do is they need to cover all sorts of mm. different resolutions so that they can resolve so not out. To mix them all together. Yeah, yeah, so that they can, um, you know, get rid of different details. There's also at different scales, you'll have different artifacts. So then they mm. can combine all the data and use that to get rid of them, yeah. basically, yeah. and so they can get the purest data yeah. possible. Okay, so we're actually looking at the papers um, that were released on the discovery. There's six of them in total. They're in a special um, sort of little booklet. But if you head to iopscience.iop.org, they're all on there, and you can quite happily have a look at them if you so wish. But there are all sorts of things that we know about black holes. So we know about the diameter of the ring. So that's the ring of material, the accretion disk. We know what at least an upper... Diameter? Right. We at least know an upper limit to how thick it is. Um, we've figured out the sort of size of the black hole compared to the size of the disk. Um, we've much more accurately figured out the mass of the black hole. Mm. Because something that was quite interesting was when they targeted M87, they didn't know whether they'd be able to see it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It entirely depended on the mass because they had a mass estimate for it and it had quite a large error. And if it was at the lower limit of that error, they weren't going to see it. If it was at the upper limit, it was going to be fine. And it turns out it was more towards the upper bit. So they, they did take and, a chance when they were looking at this. And do you want to read that mass? Because that mass is massive. <laughs> it is. It's really, really massive. 6.5 times 10 to the 9, which is 6.5 billion solar masses. Yeah, the, the masses of the sun. Yeah. Yes. 6.5 billion suns. suns is the mass of that Crammed black hole into... the mass of the stars in the galaxy is 6.2 billion suns so this black hole weighs, weighs as, much as, as much as as much as the stars in that galaxy yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah slightly more well yeah slightly more yeah, yeah so a little the, bit more the middle of the galaxy is heavier than the rest of the and the galaxy. diameter of the black hole is Four micro arc seconds, which doesn't help anyone. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, right. Yeah, so they've quoted they've quoted the size of the black hole in terms of its angular scale on the sky. Yeah, um, yeah which, that's no use. Which is of no use whatsoever. <laughs> like you can sit down and work this out, but we're in the middle of recording, so I'm not going to sit down for five minutes and have <laughs> silence. Just say, and... Well, the, the amount of mass, it's a very very small. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you can think you've got the entire galaxy. Right, has got this mass of 6.2 billion mm. suns, right? And then you've got that amount of mass again crammed into something so tiny that it took a telescope the size of Earth to be able to see it. Mm. To, or to, at least... To get, to get in, in poor resolution. Yeah, yeah. As so, everyone was moaning on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> don't even go... Yeah, I know. I tweeted, I I was like, well, oh, this was the first, yeah. the first picture of Pluto. And yeah, yeah people you, like you that. You were really pissed. I was. I was. <laughs> kilobytes. Oh, I'm on. There's a gigabyte. So I can zoom in on it. Mm. <laughs> and even though you can't see the black hole for yourself, you can certainly see an 87 for yourself. Um, and as, as we mentioned in bits um, going through this, it's um, it's a magnitude seven supergiant elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster, which is great to see this time of year uh, if you're in the northern hemisphere, and easily within reach of binoculars or small telescopes. So look out between Vindemiatrix and Nine Virginis, just above Virgo, towards Coma Berenices, and um, you can um, superimpose on that image in your mind the uh, I, I'm very black impressed hole. that you said. Vindemeatrix and Coma Berenices after that many gyms. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Kevin. <laughs> Okay, well now it's time to turn left to Ryan. This is the Astronomy Show, and that means we've gone beyond knee-deep in geek, and we're now in it, up to our necks. So let's take that next final plunge and fully immerse ourselves in the universe, because it's the Sky Guard section to inspire new astronomers to seek out new sights in the night sky, and a little nudge to the rest of you to get out and dust off the old frack. Jen, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, alright. Why not? Now, unfortunately... The situation for anything to do with planets is uh, pretty dire. No. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Very barren at the moment. Mercury, too close to the sun to be visible, is actually at superior conjunction on the 21st, which mm. means that it's going to be hiding <laughs> directly behind, behind the sun. So you're not going to be seeing Mercury anytime soon. Venus, 
close to the horizon at dawn mm-hmm. technically visible not practically so I though. just saw it the other day when I got up for work really really early and dawn I just could just see it as yeah. dawn and it was end year it's like oh that's Venus oh, yeah like, not, not really practical yeah, though no. uh, Mars is visible in Taurus in the evening twilight but it gets yeah. too low in the sky Taurus that winter constellation yeah exactly so <laughs> yeah famous spring constellation <laughs> Yeah, so technically it's another Venus, <laughs> technically visible, but yeah, not really yeah, practically yeah. so. Um, yeah, but by the end of the month, it's not even practically so, because it moves in Gemini and that's it. Um, one thing I will say is that if you do have a very clear horizon, and I mean a very clear horizon, um, you might want to try and spot Mars on the night of the 7th, because at around 10 o'clock, the thin crescent moon's going to lie just below it. Oh, okay. So that's a nice little marker. Mm. Um, have a look to the west cool. to see that. Jupiter lies in Ophiuchus, um, doesn't rise until about 11 p.m. And to be honest, it's pretty low in the sky as well. Yes. 15 degrees is its mm. peak height. So again, technically visible, not really practical. You're not gonna, certainly not gonna really get Really bright detail. though. I'm it is super bright. At like 1 a.m. last week and just it's like, whoa, what's, oh, it's, it's Jupiter, look at that. It's like, yeah, it's very bright, yeah. magnitude minus 2.5. So very much brighter than the brightest star in the sky. And next month it's actually gonna be our opposition. So that's mm. why it's so bright. Mm. Mm. Um, Saturn also terrible <laughs> uh, similarly to Jupiter it's only visible later on in the night it rises at about 1am in the constellation Sagittarius and again reaches about 15 degrees above the horizon yeah. so again nothing really practical but I've got some nice conjunctions for people mm-hmm. to spot if they've got a very clear horizon um, so this is between the 19th and the 23rd of the month about 4 o'clock in the morning so you've got to be a really early bird for this one um, we've got some conjunctions of the moon with Jupiter and Saturn. So you need to look south, southwest. Um, on the morning of the 20th, the almost full moon um, is going to lie directly between Antares and Sabique, with Jupiter then to the left of the moon. And then on the morning of the 21st, the moon's going to lie to the left of Jupiter. And on the morning of the 23rd, the moon's going to lie less than the moon's width away from Saturn. Hmm. So there's a couple of nice things yeah, that nice, you know nice. you can identify. And then at the end of the month, Ceres is actually at opposition at a very achievable Mag 7. Yeah. About okay. the same as M87. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Mm. Um, so you can hit this out on the 28th of May um, in Ophiuchus, um, and it's going to lie just on the border with Scorpius. But again, clear horizon, because the highest that this uh, minor planet gets is about 20 degrees. Mm. Don't yep. bother with planets. Look at the moon. There you are. Or the sun. If you get, you know, you've got a solar scope, don't look at the sun unless you've got a proper solar scope, for God's sake. <laughs> or solar filters on the telescope. Or solar filters yeah. on the telescope. Um, because it's something that's so critical in amateur astronomy, but is often ignored as an object in its own right, we're going to concentrate on the pole star this month. Mm, nice choice. Mm. Mm. And before we tell you how and where to find it, we'll begin with a few factoids. So, factoid numero uno, Jen. Alpha Ursae Minoris is also called Polaris, as it's the closest star to the North Celestial Pole. This means that Northern Hemisphere stars and constellations appear to rotate around Polaris, making it useful as a guide star for aligning a telescope on an equatorial mount, or for taking pretty star trail pictures. The term circumpolar refers to stars or constellations that never set below the horizon, as you'd therefore expect. They're the ones that are closest to Polaris. From mid-European and American attitudes, circumpolar constellations include Ursa Minor, of which Polaris is a component, Ursa Major, Cassiopeia, and Draco. It's sad that Polaris is often overlooked as an amateur astronomy target because it's actually a triple star system. With even the smallest telescopes, you should be able to split it into two stars using a high-power eyepiece. I have done this, and I was amazed. Because I didn't yeah. like know well, that you could you actually just do it. Ignore poor Polaris, don't I you? I know. I yeah. know, but it's just the one people put their sighting scopes yeah. yeah. on and just like that's it. Align, yeah. Move on. Not only is Polaris a triple star, but it is also get this. Yeah, back to the get this. Stories. How circular mm-hmm. is this show? <laughs> it's almost like we're planet Earth. <laughs> Cephid variable star. Mm. And a bizarre one at uh, that. Variable stars increase and decrease in brightness over time at a predictable rate. The amplitude of Polaris's brightness and dimming, however, has been decreasing since 1963. Then it went through an erratic period and now appears to be increasing again. That would make it the only known Cepheid variable star to do this reversal. Mad. 
like a structure. <laughs> <laughs> They've completed it. <laughs> that was Paul glassing Jenny. <laughs> So, due to the Earth's axis of rotation, 4,000 years ago, the star Thuba in Draco was the pole star. The North Celestial Pole will soon be making its steady move away from Polaris, such that in 2,000 years from now, old school amateur astronomers will use Eri and Cepheus to align their equatorial scopes. And to find Polaris, face north and look up halfway between the horizon and the zenith, or the highest point in the sky. Polaris doesn't visibly waver from this position at any time or night throughout the year and should be the brightest star you see in that part of the sky. If you're not certain, find the familiar shape of the plough and the last two bright stars in the bowl of the plough, Merak and Duby, they're helpfully known as the pointer stars. Trace the plough from the handle to the bowl and continue the line from the pointer stars at the end of the bowl to the yellowy-white next bright star, that's Polaris, a couple of outstretched hands width away. Well, that's the solar system and the brighter objects covered. Now it's time for the fainter fuzzies with the deep sky objects. Paul. For the deep sky this month, I'm pointing at an overlooked globular cluster M5, or NGC 5904, which is in the constellation of Serpent. This globular cluster was discovered in 1702 by Gottfried Kirk, um, though he was more interested in a nearby comet. Messier charted it while it was uh, while it was Herschel that resolved it as a cluster. Um, it's a ball of... Get this, 500,000 stars. Ooh. Well, damn. I know. There's a lot of stars. There's a lot of stars. Well, um, but it's 25,000 light years away. Um, that under the right conditions, is naked eye visible. Uh, but it, say, people forget that. So everyone gets focused on M13, yeah, and everyone yeah. forgets M5. Um, there's an apparent magnitude of just past six. So really dark sky, good Very eyes, nice. you'll yeah. see it. To find it, look for star 109 Virginus and 16 degrees east of the star Alpha Serpentis. Drawing a line between these stars and finding halfway, M5 should be easy find just below the line you have drawn. It's 165,000, 165,000, no, it's 165 light years across, which translates into 23 arc seconds in the scope. Interestingly, this is one of the oldest globs, dated at 13 billion years old and contains at least 105 variables. The brightest and most easily observed of these has a period of 26.5 days and a magnitude variance between 10.6 and 12.1. For the keen eyed and large scope, look out for a smaller, fainter glob, Palomar 5, which is just to the south of M5 and has a apparent magnitude of 11.75. Mm-hmm. So, well within a lot of scopes reach, that one. Uh, this glob is a funny elongated shape as it's believed to have been torn apart by the gravity of the core of the Milky Way. Um, and it's leaving a 30,000 light year star stream behind it, which extends well past Messier 5. Oh. Ooh, I love that. Don't oh. ever say, I don't give you something on this yeah. show. Mm-hmm. Full of factoids, that one. Look at that. So this month, I'm plumping for an old Astro Camp favourite, since we are Astro Camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, M57, the Ring Nebula. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love this one. It is a good one. So this object is well positioned for viewing all night since it rises at about quarter to eight in the evening and then it'll reach an altitude of 65 degrees before being lost to the dawn sky. The Ring Nebula lies in the constellation of Lyra and is around Mag 9. So, you know, pretty achievable for mm-hmm. most scopes. And it lies about 4,100 light years away. Now the Ring Nebula is small and faint, so it isn't the easiest to find if you have a small scope. But it is a good challenge and it is very satisfying when you do manage to find it. So to find the Ring Nebula, first locate the constellation of Lyra, which is easily found by first locating Vega in the Summer Triangle, the brightest star in the summer sky. Vega is part of the constellation of Lyra, it's kind of like a little extension to the classic parallelogram shape of the constellation. So locate this parallelogram and look to the shortest edge, which is the furthest from Vega. These stars are Beta and Gamma Lyrae, with Gamma being the furthest from Vega. They're also known as Sheliac and Sulafat, respectively. The Ring Nebula lies about a third of the way along the line drawn between those two stars, starting at Beta Lyrae. Whilst you're in the neighbourhood, why not check out Epsilon Lyrae, otherwise known as the Double Double? Because, you know, you're there. Oh, we like the Double Double. You may as well. So if you look at the constellation and you've got Gamma and Beta Lyra orientated to the south, Epsilon Lyrae can be found to the northeast of Vega, a little closer than the distance between Gamma and Beta Lyrae. And now initially, this star will resolve itself into two stars, but then with a little bit more magnification, you'll see that those stars themselves each split into two. And it looks like a double of itself. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the separation is... the 
just about the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great. So to finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with new on the 4th, first quarter is on the 12th, full on the 18th, and last quarter on the 26th. Clear skies and happy hunting. Having enjoyed the view of attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion, it's now time to get back to the real world, where no one actually cares about the Kessel Run Parsecs faux pas, and an image of the black hole that gets you and me very excited barely elicits a... Hmm. It's a funny world out there, but we have to return to it as we have to earn a living and converse with less astronomical in outlook once again. We do this podcast purely for the love. Our mothers didn't hug us enough as children. So now we're whiny, attention-seeking gambits. Well, at least Ralph is, anyway. (laughs) So to stop us going crazy, do show us the love and leave us a review somewhere. Or drop us an email at theshow at awesomeastronomy.com. I will burn you all with the hatred I reserve only for that. I mean, join us on Twitter or Facebook for a chat or comment. Share your astro images, pictures or lunch, uh, sage observations, uh, telescope porn. No cats. No cats. Cats are the best. So until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com If you want us to read your comments out on the show send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.